you know what? And I, th I was sitting in my chair in the side room of our house in Delaware, and I was thinking with all my heart, I have got to meet David when I'm in heaven. What was it about this man that he was, you know, he had this magnetism where people were just so drawn to him and served him with all their hearts, and the Holy Spirit interjected immediately, and he, said, and he spoke to my heart, if you're impressed with David, wait till you meet Jesus. I don't even know how to convey what an honor it uh, was um, when Graz called me a couple of weeks ago and said that um, Rick asked if I would cover for him. It's one of the highest honors I've ever received in ministry by far, and I didn't even know what to say, and uh, so it's a treat. And uh, this, this weekend is kind of unique that I'm with you. Uh, why is that? Well, it's six months to the day um, that I was with you last, a half a year exactly. It was the third Sunday in November. You remember we had Aaron and Moses come out of the time machine, the temple guards. It was six months to the day. But another curious thing about being here now is 20 years ago last month, I was here with the time machine. It was April 18th, 2003. It was Good Friday night. And we had Barabbas come out of the time machine with Roman jailers who mugged him when Pilate wasn't watching. So I dug that video up and did post-production on it recently and sent it to a bunch of people in the church and you can find that through one of them if you'd like to see it again. And the message was um, God's grace versus man's depravity. And very detailed, but um, the unique thing about that, and it's on film, so I'm busted, but I spilled uh, red object lesson fluid on your brand new carpet. And it was filmed, so I cut that out of, in post-production. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> but... Not so much because I was incriminated, but to save time uh, on the video, but it's just curious. But I've been coming here well before that, that I remember, at least 20 years. That was, um, and where's my brother Joe Martirana? I always look for him when I come, because Joe was a Roman out of the time machine before Barabbas. So we go back a way. So it me and Pastor Rick, what he said is so true. I really feel like I am part of your yes. church family. I really do. And i um, <laughs> Um, you might not want me to be when I tell you what I'm going to tell you now, but, uh, but uh, it truly is an honor, and I don't just say this to flatter your pastor, but um, it's really true. Every time I come here, I can tell these people are well-shepherded. You can just tell I love the unity uh, and... Uh, I know you have issues or you wouldn't be human and you wouldn't be the church, but, but I always sense that family here, and it's really an honor to be asked to come. Uh, my uh, older sister Kate is here. Uh, visit, she works at, how many have heard of Transformation Life Center? Uh, TLC. Katie serves at that, and I'll be with those, uh, those uh, dear men tomorrow morning. So um, worship team people, are you still here? They let me sleep in their church office, every, or their worship team office every time I come, per my request. Yeah, they all left. I don't doubt it. Okay. <laughs> but it, I, I always uh, love staying there, too. But, um, and when I, uh, I wanted to, I did this with the first service, and I mean it, but um, uh, two years ago, um, I was preparing a message for my camp staff, as I always do in the spring, to inspire them and give them vision uh, for ministering to the camps that we do every summer. And uh, I was studying a segment. It wasn't the main part of the message, but it was about the life of David. And I was just different aspects of how David was so revered and he was so reverenced and honored by his people. That his mighty men, whom I believe many of them could defeat David one-on-one -on -one in combat, I really do, and yet they laid down their lives for him. And why did they, who were so much more powerful and could have led, why did they follow him? It was his heart for God. That's why, though more powerful physically, they submitted to his authority because of his heart for God. All right. Now, in that study, um, there was, David was about to go out to battle again, as he always did. David was a man of war, a man of blood, uh, killing many of the Lord's enemies. And so when he went to go to battle in his later years, uh, one of his men came up to him and said something like this. My Lord. If we go in battle and we run from the enemy, they will not care. My Lord, if we enter into the fray and some of our men fall, the enemy will pay no mind. But if you, my Lord, fall, you are worth 10,000 of us.
And I found as I was doing that meditation and study on David's life, I thought, what an incredible man this man was. Or even one, a woman who was sent by Joab uh, to deceive David. And then he, of course, he saw right through her, and she goes, I perceive my Lord is like an angel of God. You know what? And I, th I was sitting in my chair in the side room of our house in Delaware, and I was thinking with all my heart, I have got to meet David when I'm in heaven. What was it about this man that he was, you know, he had this magnetism where people were just so drawn to him and served him with all their hearts, and the Holy Spirit interjected immediately, and he, said, and he spoke to my heart, if you're impressed with David... Wait till you meet Jesus. <laughs> wow. Wow. Because I just found myself as studying these texts about David, and I wanted to meet him so badly when I got to heaven. And you know the Holy Spirit is jealous over our affections for Jesus. Amen. You know that, right? It was not wrong to think that way about David, but I love how the Holy Spirit interrupted me. He said, where do you meet Jesus? <laughs> ah! Uh, brother, I will never forget what you told me before the service the rest of my life. When he was gone for 90 seconds, he said, he goes, I didn't see Jesus. And he goes, I got mad. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely love it. I will never, I'll probably tell a million people that too. <laughs> my buddy got mad because he didn't get to see Jesus in 90 seconds. He was gone. But we are so, so grateful. Our, our father has plans yes. for him. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> Let me do this now before I break my fingers, okay? But um, I wanted to say, share something with you. Is, I'm always terrified of it. It's the most dangerous object lesson I have of hundreds of them in my basement. But it's for you. Um, I first started giving this message in, in, on a Reformation Sunday of last year, last Sunday in October. Um, and I've given it many times in many places, but my frustration is, is that I never get through anywhere near the whole message. It is six pages of typed notes. And then on top of the typed notes, you can see I have lots of handwritten, because I, what, 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 why? Because of the nature of the ministry I do, I will bring the same message in many places many times. It's the nature of the, the work the Lord has called me to because of the content of them. So what I do is go back to the message and study it more, meditate on it more, pray about it more. And so I get more and more insights and more object lessons. And I just, it's, and so the frustration in, in, in the months of giving this, uh, I've never been able to give the whole thing. And it's very, because every line, in my opinion, of these notes, I sit there and I can just read a few words and I'm so impacted and stunned, like I could stay at that place for hours and just a few words, boom! And they punch me in the face with the weight of the glory of the Word of God. The Word of God is fraught with weight. If you let it get you, it just throbs with nuclear power. And the longer you spend time on it, the more radioactive it becomes. And so that's the happens to me. Uh, my big brother Jimmy was surprised at a wedding we were at recently where he, he's, he learned that I don't read books. I don't read books. At least I don't finish them. And I heard years ago they say that my personality doesn't f re finish books, and it's true. I can't remember. Very, very rarely why I read a, a whole book all the way through. I just don't. What I do is I'll take a portion of a book and just read it again and again and again and again and just keep digging in that same place and meditate on it and I just, there's more, I want more and more and more. That's the nature of the way I'm wired, but that's what I do with the text of Scripture too. I'm not encouraging that, um, but that's just who I am. And so the, I say that to say this is that um, I just, against everything in me the way I'm wired, because I learned how to preach preaching to children for 14 years, is that I'm desperate to keep their attention, hence this, and hence, I rarely look at notes. Um, you'll probably remember with me over the years that Gertie mostly quotes the text as he moves down the table. But you know what? I've been so grieved because there are so many powerful things in this. And so I, you know, I just was praying about it. So you know what I'm going to try to do? Instead of bringing an entirely different message next Sunday, which was my initial plan, I was going to preach on Colossians 1, verses 12 through 20. Not only one of the most important texts in the New Testament, but in the whole Bible. But I thought, you know what, Lord? I don't remember ever having two Sundays in a row at the same church. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to see if I can do that and just split this 
message into two parts. Well, guess what? The first service, I only got not even a third way through. But you know what? I trust they were fed. That was my ache and my burden. They were fed. You know, and that's, I don't want to send God's people home away hungry. Remember? So, Lord, I just, Lord Jesus, these precious people, um, that Father, thank you. They did not choose you. You chose them. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, they're your people. They're your sheep. And one of the greatest, we know, evidences is if a preacher loves Jesus, they will feed his sheep. So, Lord, may, may, whoa, wow, may that happen today, this morning, Lord, uh, please just take us in the, in the notes as far as you want us to go, Lord. Um, and I, I hope I get farther, Lord, than the first service, I really do. So we just, ah, we give you the service, Lord. It's probably a good thing to pray when you're dealing with this. Um, <laughs> Okay, so that's, those are the introductions, okay? Luke 2.39. Dismiss now, Lord, your servant in peace. For my eyes have beheld your salvation. Simeon was holding a person. You notice the Lord's salvation was a person. Not ritual. Not religious ceremonies or something you did every Sunday. Not a code. Not a set of morals. What did he say? My eyes have beheld your salvation. All of the salvation of God is in one person and one person alone. And notice that the person was outside of Simeon. All of God's salvation is in one person and what that person has done. All Simeon was doing was holding him. My eyes have beheld your salvation. Now, when the angel came to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, what did he say? You shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. Have you ever pondered, beloved, why the angel, who of course spoke from the Holy Spirit, if an angel speaks to you and it isn't what the Holy Spirit gave them, it's a fallen angel. Remember I told you the last time we were here, the, the most favorite thing that demons love to do is teach. 1 Timothy 4.1, right? Doctrines of demons. They would much rather be in a seminary than in a brothel. Right? Think about it. The biggest thing the devil wants is the pulpit. You get the pulpit, you get the people. So, he shall save his people from their sins. So what, why, why just, did he just say sins when there are so many things that happen besides sin that come in addition to it? Well, the, the principle of sin is like a domino effect. Once the sin is committed, it puts into an effect an automatic and very rapid domino effect. All you got to do, beloved, is touch the first domino, right? You've done that before, right? And you've probably seen videos where it went for four and a half miles. And people had, had a lot of time on their hands. But that's exactly what happens, right? The domino effect happens, and all it takes is one sin. If I want to blow off these three dynamite sticks, do I have to have a fuse on every stick? I only need one fuse, don't I? Guaranteed, when I light that fuse... All this, whatever dynamite stick happens to go off first, what happens to the other two? They go off, all right? That's the principle of sin. That's why the devil was so desperate to have Adam and Eve sin. He only wanted one sin because he knew, based on what happened to him, what would happen to them. He knew by experience. And here's the thing that comes to me. Kim and I, my wife Kim and I, we recently watched uh, Snow White not that long ago. How many have seen Snow White? That's when Disney had half a brain, okay, okay? And they haven't become the cesspool that they've been, right? Snow White, it's one of the most poignant and powerful movie scenes I've ever seen, having watched it again recently. Why? Because it's such a graphic and very accurate depiction of what the devil is like. Remember, in Ezekiel chapter 28, it says the, the devil was a guardian cherub. He was perfect in wisdom and beauty, amen? Remember the queen in Snow White, she was gorgeous, all right. Remember, she used to ask the mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? Then one day, the, the white, remember the white face in the mirror? He said, there's one more fairer than thee, 
Snow White, it is she. Something, remember that? So what did the queen do in her jealousy? She didn't go to Snow White as herself. She didn't want Snow White to know she was the queen, right? How did she go? Remember, she went as the old hag who, but she called herself Old Granny, remember? And good grief, it, it scared me now watching it as an adult. I mean, how hideous she looked. And so, of course, she went to, when the devil went to Eve, how did he go? Did he go as the beautiful, gorgeous guardian cherub? What did he go as? A snake, a snake. You might think, well, Eve should have run as a snake. No, no, because the scripture says it was only one of the many wild animals the Lord God had made. So there were snakes everywhere. All right, so what does he do? He goes to her. So here's the thing that really gripped me as I meditated on it. This is why I keep adding to my notes and keep writing more and more in, because I meditate more on it. All right, here's what happens. She goes, take it, eat it, just take it. She was so desperate to have Snow White just take one bite. Why? What would happen to Snow White when she ate it? She would die. Good, good. And there were, remember the animals were trying to stop her? And, oh, oh, the poor old granny. Here. Oh. She was putting all this show on, just trying to get Snow White to pity her. Oh, no, here, no, take it, take it. Just one bite, one bite. Good, go, go, go. And remember when Snow White, of course, ate it? Oh, oh. And then she falls and you see her hand and let go. The apple rolls across the floor. See? That's exactly what the devil was like. Do you ever thought about this? When, when Kim and I were pacing and praying around the floor of our home the other night, which we try to do from time to time, I was praying for our time together here. And um, this is what came to me from meditating on these, and I shared it with Kim as we were praying, is that you notice that the devil did not do this. When he was kicked out of heaven, and you can be sure, what did Jesus say? I saw Satan fall like light. Boom! He was gone. Consider the kindness and the severity of God. God chose not to have any merciful redemption on fallen angels. They were sealed in their wickedness. They were sealed in number. The angels are a company. They're not a race. What does that mean? They don't reproduce. So the, the, the evil angels on that fall in the rebellion were sealed, the number of them, and who they are. No hope of redemption. So this is what the devil should have done, right? He should have gone to Adam and Eve and said, Oh, Adam and Eve... Oh, I, I can't believe I've fallen from the estate that I had. I had such privilege and rank, and I, I, I was perfect in wisdom and beauty, and I was close to the throne of God, and I let my, the pride of my heart take me over, and I tried to overthrow God, Isaiah 14. And that's, please don't make the mistake I did. I lost everything for my pride and rebellion. Did he do that? This is, shows you how thoroughly wicked, with no hope of redemption in him, he goes and he shows who he really is, he sinned. What does he do? He encourages them to sin. He knew what would happen. And that only because of the holiness of God, the devil knew one sin kills it. The devil knew it. And he goes right to them and tries to get them to sin. What was the first thing that Eve did after she ate the fruit? She gave it to her husband who was with her. First thing Eve did after she sinned was encourage someone else to sin. Whew. So he shall save his people from their sins. So what happened? When Adam ate the fruit, you see, it's all the devil wanted, and then he's gone. He got what he wanted. Why? What happened? Romans chapter 5 says that when the fruit was eaten, Romans chapter 5 says that major things, repercussions, consequences immediately kicked in. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death spread to all men because all men sinned. So what happened? He ate a piece of fruit one time. And what happened? Death not only entered Adam and Eve, but it also entered the whole human race. Every single human being since then that conceived immediately starts to age and die. Because of the bite of a piece of fruit by one man one time. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 17 says that death not only entered the world, but it also reigned. What else help happened? Romans chapter 5, um, I think it's verse 15. It says that the, the sentence of condemnation. So there was a judgment made by the bite of a piece of fruit by one man one time. The sentence of condemnation. And not only that, Romans 5, 18 says by the bite of a piece of fruit by one man one time. It says, many were made sinners. All it took was the first domino. All it took was the first dynamite stick to go. So, 
Of course, the angel knew this, but this is what he was instructed. Because notice that the only thing he was told to tell uh, Joseph was that he will save his people from their sins. Why? It's because if you're saved from your sin, all the other stuff is non-existent. It doesn't happen unless you sin. The devil learned the hard way. So he will save his people from their sins. But immediately, what is the consequence of sin as we said? In the day you eat of it, you shall surely. Genesis 2.16. Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 18. The soul that sins will die. Romans 6, 23. The wages or the payment that you earn for sin is, is death. Some of the saddest words that came from the Son of God in, Roman, in John chapter 8 were, you will die in your sins. Wow. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you... Paul is talking to the Ephesian Christians, what they were before Jesus came and got them. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. So it's impossible for death not to follow sin. So when he saves his people from their sins, well, the first thing that happens is he saves them from death. Amen? Saving them from their sins also means that he saves them from the slavery of sin. Jesus said, he who commits sin, meaning habitually, in John chapter 8, is a slave to sin. Romans chapter 6 says, all of us, before Jesus Christ came inside of us by the power of his spirit and regenerated us, gave us a new nature, we were slaves to sin. Sin has no mercy. Remember in Genesis chapter 4, this is what happened with Cain. This is about the power of sin that we're being freed from. Remember, you remember the story? Well, Cain and Abel both offered sacrifices. With Abel's, he was pleased. With Cain's, he was not. What did Cain do? I'm so, like, was he like the devil? Is, is this the way? I'm so sorry, Lord. I learned my lesson. I'm going to try better. Now. No. What is he? What did, who got angry when Cain was the one who sinned? Cain did. Cain's face became downcast, and he's the one who sinned against God. Welcome to human nature. So he does that, but the Lord is so tender and he goes personally and entreats him. Don't you know if you do right, you'll be accepted? But then he goes, but if you don't do right, behold, sin lies and crouches at the door like a wild animal. Cain, it desires to have you. Remind you of 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because our enemy, the devil, roams like a... Like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. See the nature of sin, beloved? Why we had to be saved from it? My goal for these two weeks, these two Sundays, is that you have a much expanded knowledge of what you are saved from besides sins. And I know the angel, what he told Joseph, didn't just mean that. But I'm expanding on that little. How many of you have cell phones? Come on. No, you, no it's more than that. What do you have on your cell phone? It's like a one quarter inch by one quarter inch graphic. You have all kinds of them on your phone. What do you call those? Apps, true. What's the other word for it? Icon. Icon? That's a Greek word. Icon for images. So, you know, it's, oh, it's, just a, it's just a one quarter inch by one quarter inch. What can that do? But what happens when you tap the icon? <laughs> right? It takes you to the vast recesses of internet and, not in cyberspace. That's the way sin works. All you did was eat a piece, bite of a piece of an, a fruit one time. All these other things kick in. This is what my goal is for God's people and for myself. The more I immerse myself in these truths from the word of God, they don't repulse me and they don't make me not interested in God anymore. Like seeker sensitive churches avoid these doctrines and their church is a million miles wide and a quarter inch, quarter inch deep. Why? Because they think if we teach those things, people won't come. Yeah, but look who you have. I've often said this. I'll say it again. I'd rather have 10 people in my church who want all of God than 10,000 who want half of him. And you rob God of glory when you don't take. <laughs> Makes my blood boil. They're robbing God of glory. Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul in Romans eleven twenty two, told the saints, Behold, consider, think about, ponder the kindness, seeker sensitive churches, and the severity of God. You don't know, really appreciate or understand God's kindness unless it's on the stage with the curtain behind it of his severity. Why? Why does it have to be that way? Since Genesis 3, it has to be that way. If there were no fall, 
wouldn't have to consider the severity of God that much. But you see, God ordained and allowed the fall. Why? Because it brings out more of his glory than if he had kept it from happening, which he could have easily have done. But you see, I'm getting into another whole sermon. So he saved us from our sins. He saved us from death. Now, let's, uh, I got to keep this in the order for the people who, uh, for last, the, the last service. Uh, we only got through one third. Okay, but we're going to try our best. So what, what did Adam do? that caused the sin trap to, to snap and kick all these other things in gear. Well, it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, Adam sinned by breaking a command. He said of all the, remember what the Lord told him, Eve wasn't even created yet when the Lord told him this. He said of all the trees of the garden, you are free to eat, but only the tree, right, of the knowledge of good and, a fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat that, tr that fruit or you will die, as we said earlier. So Adam sinned by breaking a command. So Adam had the law of that command, but he also had the law of God, of, cor of course, even though it wasn't given for thousands of years later, he still had the law of God like pagans do, Gentiles do, atheists do, written on their hearts. Romans chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. So Adam broke a command. So what happens? The law, by saving us from our sins, he saves us from all the repercussions of the law. Well, what do you mean? Well, let's, let's go down the list a little bit. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. If you think about, talk about, have more emotions about, have more energy about, spend more time with, uh, then God and his kingdom and his work, that's an idol. It's an idol. Last I checked, the reason that you're existing is to live for the glory of God so that you are so enraptured with him is that the, that the more people look at you, the more highly they think of him. That's living for the glory of God. And if you're not doing that, though, you're the nicest person in your neighborhood. As far as God's concerned, you're a rebel. Because you're not living for why he put you here. You see? So we're all guilty, are we not? We've broken the first one. What's the second one? You should not make unto you uh, any graven images. Speaking of cell phones, guilty is charged. Come on, we, we think those people in the Old Testament are so stupid bowing down to idols of worship, and, you know, worship idols of brass and stone and wood. Come on, people, how often do we behold and give our eyes to the screens and the ears and our emotions and our time and our money and our fervency and our devotion and our loyalty and allegiance? We have graven images. You should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. A, man, a young man in the scriptures in Deuteronomy, I believe it was, he blasphemed the name. He was taken outside the camp and he was stoned. Because when you blaspheme God's name or use it in vain, you're, you're blaspheming his person. His name represents who he is. Shall honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Guilty is charged. You shall, not, you shall honor your father and your mother. Um, I don't think Kate would remember this, but when I was 15 years old or so, I got very angry with my father. Went up to my bedroom and cursed him out. I was too afraid to do it to his face. If I lived in the days of the law, Romans 10, 28, anyone who violates the law of Moses dies without mercy. Dies without mercy at the mouth of two or three witnesses. If someone in the neighborhood, if I was living in Moses' day, heard me curse my dad out, they'd go and tell the elders, they would come in my bedroom, drag me out of my bedroom, out of my house, out of my neighborhood, and stone me. That's how holy God is. You shall not murder. I'm ashamed to say as a Christian, I've murdered too many people in my heart. I'm ashamed to say it, but yep, I've gotten angry enough to where it was murderous anger. As a Christian, guilty as charged. You should not commit adultery. We all know what Jesus said, didn't he? All you got to do is think it in your mind, desire it in your heart. You're guilty before God. You should not covet or desire anything that belongs to your neighbor. No matter what it is, guilty as charged shall not bear false witness, you shall not steal. Now here's the thing. It also says in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if you keep the whole law your entire life and only break it one time, your entire life, you've broken the whole law. How many remember that text? That's a hard one, isn't it? It seems unjust, but we know with the Lord, one day I got to bring this object lesson that it sits in my basement most of the time for years. It's one of the most powerful ones, my, one of my favorite ones. I hardly ever use it. It's an oscilloscope. From, uh, they used to use them repairing televisions years ago. 
But the reason I bring it is because if you set it, set it right, it has a green line just going across the, the circle screen, just a straight green line. And what I use it for is that is the mode of God's perfection. God always runs every single second of every single day at optimum performance. He can never do anything better than he does or less than he does. He's 100% all the time. And everything he does, everything he doesn't do, everything he allows, he never has a less than 100% perfection performance. How do you know, Michael? Let's start because he's God. He's perfect. A lot of you probably, like me, felt he's dropped the ball many times with you. He doesn't know how to drop the ball. It's amazing what he lets us judge him with. I love what Job said. In all these things, Job did not sin with his lips by charging God with wrongdoing. Here's what happens, beloved. Break, the whole, break one law in my entire life and I've broken it all? Take the knife. You've seen this with another message I've done, but good to be reminded. Come up here and stick it in my left shoulder. What would I do? Ow, pain, left shoulder hurts. Would I do that? No, I go, ow! Lighten up, Gertie. It's just your shoulder. But you see, you not only cut my tendons, but it affected my nerves. Oh, I only stuck you in the shoulder. No, it affected my nerves. And then, of course, my emotions are racing and they're crushed because why would you hate me so much that you want to do it to me? It affects my mind. My brain is, my thoughts are racing like mad because I'm trying to process and figure out logistically why would you do that to me? So you affected so much of me and all you did was stick my left shoulder. You see the way it is with God? You're going to walk up to God and say, God, I never committed adultery. Yeah, but you stole from your company three times. You've You've offended him. That's how a unity God is. And so, then it says this too about the law. My goal is that you are clinging to Jesus by the time we're done and kissing his feet more than you did before the service began. That's the whole purpose of this message. And I pray I get to at least half of it. All right, but so the people in the first service will have to watch this, this part one because I only, I didn't even get that far with them. What about the nature of the law? Hebrews chapter two, verse one. Therefore, we must pay more careful attention to the things that we have seen or heard. Why? Because of the message given by angels was binding. What do you mean, Gertie? You're holding up the Ten Commandments. I thought the Lord gave that to Moses. He did, but he gave it to Moses through angels. Galatians 3.19, Acts chapter 7, verses 38 and 53. And then it's like in this text too, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, that God used angels. So angels, of course, were far less uh, majestic and glorious than God. Far less and yet more majestic and glorious than us. So even though, so even a message given via angels, it says anyone who violated the law, remember what I said, law of Moses died without mercy? Now watch in Hebrews chapter 2, it says that you've got to pay more attention to the things that you have heard because of the angels spoken by, the message given by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. This is the nature of the law. I'm going to try so good to look with my notes, which I I told you before, because I don't want to miss anything with this. So what happens? You've seen this before with another message. Compared to the law of God, we all get a report card because there are children in the room. We adults know it's a crime record, though, too. That's on your most moral day when you think you're really doing well morally, compared to God's holiness, congratulations, you're an F minus. On your best day, you see. So what happens more? This is, the, this is why it's so critically important. He shall save his people from their sin. And what did he save us from so far? He saved us from the slavery of sin, the bondage of sin. He saved us also from, the, from death, What else also comes when we're saved from our sin? We're saved from the law. And as it being the obligation that we must keep perfectly in order to be received by God and enter eternal life. So you see, beloved, in that little icon of sin, it just opens up the cyberspace of so many other things that we need to be redeemed from. So what happened? It says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41, that if you're a lawbreaker, 
One day, angels are coming for you, and Jesus is sending them. Matthew 13, 41, the Son of Man will send forth his angels to gather out of his kingdom all lawbreakers and those who do iniquity. Do you see how precious, beloved, the law of God is? So by sinning against the law of God, which we see, and this is not an exaggeration, exponentially trillions of times each day and night around the surface of the globe. You see, and with, no impu with, with impunity, people get away with all kinds of things. That is not because God is not just and holy. It's because he's long suffering, you see. So being saved from sin saves us from the law. Now, just want to make sure I don't miss any of these precious texts that just, that just melt your soul. Okay. Now I forget. Is it three or four, buddy? Three o'clock or four o'clock? I'm done by. Okay. Never was good at math. Okay. All right. So he saved us from his, our sins. Now, Romans chapter four, verse 15. The law brings wrath. I'm hoping to get through this section. I didn't finish it with the first group. By being saved from our sins, Hebrews 12, 25, 20, 12 29 says, our God is a consuming fire. We are saved from the wrath of God. The law brings wrath. Uh, the wrath of God is like a volcano. How many of you, of course, know before a volcano erupts and does its devastating destruction that no one escapes from. It obliterates everything in its path. How many of you know the volcano didn't start having compression under the ground like 20 minutes before? It can lie dormant on the surface vis-a-vis -vis the long-suffering of God. But underneath, it can take centuries and sometimes millennia, doesn't it? where the molten lava is just swirling and churning deep beneath the surface of the earth and it's building up gases and pressure to where it comes to a place where it can no longer, the earth cannot keep it contained. That is the wrath of God. He will hold back his, his wrath long, long periods of time. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 9, verse 22, what of God desiring to show his wrath? He desires to show how much he hates sin. His wrath comes from his holiness. Not a molecule of his wrath is sinful or selfish like most of ours is. You see, so when the Lord holds it down, he desires to show his wrath and make his power known. But what if he's holding it back? And it says, of course, in 923, which pertains to you, what if he's doing it to show the great compassion and riches of his grace to his vessels of mercy, which are his people? So even now he's holding back his, his eschatological wrath, end times wrath, as he's gathering in his people and having mercy on them. The wrath of God is never to be avoided or shirked or ignored. If you do that, my dear people of God, you will, your, your knowledge of God will be so shallow. You won't fear him. You won't honor and respect him like you could exponentially more. Seeker sensitive churches do not cover his wrath, like I said earlier. They rob him of his glory because it's one of the most glorious things about him. Every drop of his wrath is adorable. Remember, because it comes from the green line, the perfect being. He only gives wrath when it's deserved. And many, many times when he does pour it out, he doesn't give all that's deserved. So in order for you to understand Calvary, you must know his fury or you won't appreciate Calvary. Let's talk about the wrath of God. Glorious, glorious subject. And in the, in, this is by the German scholar Kittel. And these are some of the things that just, just melt my heart. And I've read these so many times and they still break me. The most common Hebrew word in the Old Testament that we translate wrath in, the, in English, it literally means snorting. <laughs> I always picture when I ponder on that like a bull that's ready, getting ready. That is a description of the anger of divine rage. The second most common, and that's 170 times that Hebrew word is used for God's wrath. The second, the second most common word is that of heat or passion. Remember the molten lava? That's used 70 times for the wrath of God. God's wrath always threatens the existence of those concerned. When God's wrath breaks forth, 
it affects the whole earth. Watch this one. God's wrath is a death-dealing intervention when God's holiness is violated. It's God's death-dealing intervention when his holiness is violated. His people have to know these things. The world could care less. That's the irony of it. The freight train loaded with steel with 700,000 cars on it is barreling towards the lost and they're partying while it's coming. Whew. Watch, the wrath of God is God's onslaught in his assertion of his claim to dominion. This is one of my favorite that just gets me. God's wrath is God's attack on all forces that resist his holy will. Aren't you glad he's like that? His wrath is God's attack on all forces that resist his holy will. Isn't it the most vile evil for anyone or anything to resist the altogether lovely, perfect one, his will? God's wrath is adorable, beloved. There's a text that I could probably spend five months on and no other text in the Bible every day and just melt and adore is Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 10. It talks about in verse 9 about the faithfulness of the Lord. But then it goes, the Lord repays those who hate him to their faces. Ever been punched in the face? It's one of the most degrading, humiliating things that can happen. But you see in the holiness of God, it says God will repay those who hate him, which is the most evil thing a creature can do, is to hate God. Why? Because of the magnificence of his person. The infinitude of his person and his dignity. To hate him shows the depths of evil in a human being or an angel. So God repays those who hate him to their faces. What To do what? To destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. That doesn't make me not want to come to church anymore. You know what it does to me? Father, 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 you are so holy, Lord. Do you notice the seraphim, the only place they're mentioned in the whole Bible is Isaiah chapter 6? What do they say day and night? Holy, holy, holy. And one scholar said they aren't inarticulate. They got a whole vocabulary they could use of things. But look what they say, beloved. Wow. Wow. Matthew 3.12, 3, Jesus' kinsman, John the Baptist, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John 3.36, John said, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on them. Present tense in the Greek and English. That means anyone who is not in Jesus Christ and Jesus isn't in them, right now, at this moment, the wrath of God is over them. It abides on them. And yet we tell them that God loves them unconditionally. It's such a lie. He doesn't love them unconditionally. He did the greatest act of love in providing his only son. But if they die in their sin and hate God... They're not going to be loved unconditionally for all eternity. They will know the hatred of God. We can't even hear that without being repulsed. But remember, beloved, God's hatred is pure. He only hates things that are evil and deserve it. It's even hard for me to say the hatred of God, but I've come to adore it. Thank you, Lord. You only hate evil things. The hatred of God and the wrath of God for eternity. We must understand God's fury if we're to understand God's Calvary. You will have such a very shallow, beloved, understanding of the cross unless you get the fury of God down. And I'm preaching to myself. This is why I immerse myself in this. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Romans 5, 9. Romans 6, 16 and 17. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. Look how he has turned your hearts where now you have a heart. All you want to do is see his face. But for those who hate him, what do they say? Hide us from his face. We are longing, are we not, to finally see Jesus? It's been called the beatific vision. His face! 
But look at what the people in the end times are saying. Hide us from his face, the wrath from him who sits on the throne, meaning the Father, watch now, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus has been given authority to judge because he's the Son of Man. What does that mean? Of the three persons of the Trinity or the Godhead, he alone is the one who was incarnated and went to the cross. And the, God the Father was pleased to have him do all judgment. And so Jesus now, because he was the Lamb, notice it's not the Lion of Judah, it's the Lamb who was treated like a piece of meat in a butcher shop by human beings. But now it's his turn. He's, done, he's gone through his sacrifice and his death. Now it's his turn. Now, uh, I want to make sure. Now watch. How about Hebrews chapter 1030? This is a new note from the other day in my, in my back room. What does the Lord say? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I'm getting tingles down my arms. Isn't that selfish? No. Remember the green line. God can't be selfish. You know what? It's zealous. When God wants vengeance, it's not selfish. It's zealous. Wow, I will repay. For those who keep rejecting the Lord and saying no and spitting in his face and spurning his son, there's only one thing left for them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27. A certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume his enemies. Now, the Greek word there for fury is actually the, the word we get zealous from. God has a zeal with his wrath. And it all comes from his holiness. Aren't you glad it doesn't come from a sin in him? It comes from holiness. Wow. I, I've, got, I've, I've got to get through this next part. How much time do we have? I don't, you can be honest with me. I can take it. Are we almost done? Are we done, buddy? Okay, I, I, this is what I, the section I wanted to finish with the first group and I didn't, forgive me. Now, this is very important. Um, think of all the, the examples there are, and there are way too many to count, of, the, of, of exhibitions of God's wrath in the Old Testament. First of all, there are so many, but how about the flood from heaven? Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 17, the Lord says to Noah, Behold, I, even I, Emphatic, am sending a flood of water upon the earth to destroy every living thing that has the breath of life in it from under heaven. So I've heard different estimates from millions to billions of people that it were alive at the time of the flood. I don't know the exact number, but God took personal responsibility for drowning at least millions and millions of people, including children. Oh, so here, what, you, you want to challenge the green line again, don't you? No, 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 no. Because we already know from Genesis 6-5 and Genesis 8-21, especially Genesis 8-21, that they continued to do evil all the time. That's all they ever did, the imaginations of their heart. Ready now? From their childhood. No teenagers on the ark either. Wow. Exhibition, I've got to keep going because I want to get to the last point before we close for part two. What about uh, fire from heaven? Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. The Lord Jesus Christ, in, before he became a man, but he appeared at different times as a human being on earth, interacting with his people. He was with Abraham, with the two other angels, of course, who went down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And what does it say? It says, Abraham remained standing before the Lord. So the third of the three angels was actually the son of God. And it, before he became man and, you know, lived on the earth, so what does it say? It says in Genesis 19, 24, Then the Lord, meaning Jesus on earth with Abraham, rained down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire, watch now, from the Lord, meaning God the Father, in heaven. 2 Peter 2, 6 says that he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. This is building up to a point that will stun you, that will close the service with us. When you, I give you these examples and then tell you the last text I'm going to quote to you, it will stun you. All right? What about when he, in Numbers chapter 16, when Korah and his rebellion? Remember, he challenged Moses, so again, here it is again, another coup, another takeover by people who already had real high ranking, like the devil, their father. Korah and his rebellion and men, 250 men of rank in Israel already had high privilege being Levites. They wanted the priesthood. So remember, they rose up against Moses. What did Moses say? If these people, if these men are, are doing, if these men die a natural death like you'd expect with human beings, then it's, it wasn't God. But if something unusual happens, if the earth opens up and swallows them whole, they and their families, and the other text says, and their little ones, 
and everything that belongs to them, then you will know that the Lord did this. And that's exactly what happened. It says they went alive down into the grave. Reminds you of the beast and the false prophet in Revelation. It says they were seized and thrown alive into the lake of fire. The wrath of God. You're going you're to be stunned when I conclude this. And I'm so thankful, Pastor Rick, for your, your kind permission because it's, I pray it's going to be worth it. Uh, just another example of fire from heaven. Remember in, in, in Exodus chapter 9 against the Egyptians, it says that fire came down with hail. Very interesting word, though, where it says that the fire walked within the fire, so to speak. It was like circling, and it was going along the ground. It came from God. What about in 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, 2 Kings chapter 1, where remember when the, the evil king sent captains of their 50s to Elijah to call him to see the king? If I am a man of God, let fire from heaven fall down on you and your men. <laughs> ah! Happened twice, remember? Fire from heaven. These are outbursts, beloved, of the wrath of God in the Old Testament. When the Israelites were fighting in Joshua chapter 10, an, an evil army, what does it say? It says that the Lord began throwing huge hailstones on their enemies. And then it says that at the end of the battle, more of their enemies died from the Lord's hailstones than from Israel's swords. What about when the Lord, in, in uh, Numbers chapter 21, the Lord, because the people were grumbling, he sent poisonous snakes among them. Remember? They were killing people sent by the Lord. What about the plague after Korah's rebellion when the earth swallowed them up? The very next day, the Israelites, though they saw the earth swallow this rebellion, they started blaming Moses and Aaron for it. What happened? 14,700 of them died from a plague. Who sent it? Well, it was the devil. No, it wasn't. It was the holy God. You see, I'm going to say it again. If you don't understand his wrath like this, you will not understand Calvary. I'm, I'm, I got to, oh, help me, Lord Jesus, because I want to get to that point. He would send wild animals. The Lord will use the sun that was made for our good and keeps us alive as a weapon in Revelation 16, 8. In the last times, he'll use it to scorch men. Again, the Lord does it. The Lord sent, remember the death of the firstborn in Egypt. All right, remember it says, in, but it says, in, uh, we know that the angel came and started killing the firstborn. But watch what it says also in, in Psalm 78, verse 49. It says, the Lord set a band of destroying angels. You see, this should be breeding the fear of the Lord in you. You, you. This is what, the fear of the Lord is clean. It's pure. When you hear things like this, beloved, or read things like this, it makes you want to live more holily and to cling to him more tightly. And you don't want to do the things that you did prior to knowing this stuff. And that's a good thing. That's why we need to hear it more often. I'll tell you, there's nothing else I want to do, but just stand and hold the cross for all I'm worth. Because if you take one step away from the cross, you drop into the bottomless pit. And this is what does it. This is the fear of the Lord. Doesn't it drive you away from God? No, it drives me to him. It makes me hold him more tightly. So watch now. I'm gonna, I could use so many other examples, but now watch all of those examples of exhibitions of God's wrath in the scripture. Watch what this says. Oh, I guess I'll save this for next week, but watch what this, this is it. In, in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, watch what it says. First of all, verse, it says in 24 that Jesus was made a propitiation for God's people. What is that? It's the offering of a sacrifice to take away wrath. It was in his blood. And the second part of this message tonight, next Sunday just exalts and magnifies the blood of Jesus. And the more you get this, the more you under... That's why all those hymn writers in the days gone by used to write so many songs about the blood that seem so yicky to sinners. And even some Christians today, they don't understand this, you see. But it says in Romans 3.25, God displayed Jesus publicly. God displayed Jesus on the cross publicly in Jerusalem, the center of the world, in the middle of time, Galatians 4, 4, the fullness of time. Why? To demonstrate his righteousness. Now watch, this is what I was leading up to that's going to blow your mind. Why, why did God finally have to say, I must show the universe, both angelic beings and humans, how holy and righteous and how much I hate sin. How did he do it? Right here. 
right there. That was proof for all time that God is holy. Well, wh why? Why did he need to do this? This is the thing I was building up to. It says, because in his forbearance, this is Romans 3.25, God left the sins previously committed from Adam until the cross. He passed over them. After all those exhibitions of wrath you just said? Yep. That still was not enough to show how much he hated sin and how righteous he was. They were just little exhibitions. But Gertie, he flooded the whole world! Doesn't come close to what he did here. It says he passed over the sins previously committed. That's why he had to once and for all demonstrate his righteousness, Romans 3.25. Jesus is his propitiation. That's a long word. It's one of the most beautiful in the English language. Hard to say, hard to spell. What does it mean again, Gert? The removal of wrath by the offering of a sacrifice. The more you know his fury, the more you understand Calvary. So by his grace, we will continue with this next Sunday and get to the end, okay? So thank you, Father. Thank you. For these precious people, Lord, I, I just see it in their eyes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I see it in their eyes, dear Lord. Precious Jesus. If there is someone in here and you are not a Christian and you know it, I pray by the words that you heard today that were from, I pray, God's word and not Michael's. That something is stirring and moving on your heart where I must know this Jesus, this Savior he talks about. Beloved, he is your only hope to flee from the wrath to come. Abandon all of your sin. Abandon all of your good works. They only a stench in God's nostrils. And run to the Savior, Jesus Christ, who offers you full forgiveness of all the sins you've ever done and all you ever will commit. If you trust in him, all of your sins are placed on him. And Jesus gives you his report card, which is the perfect one that God does and must require of every human being. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, meaning the Lord Jesus, shall be saved. Lord, I ask you to seal the word. Your precious people's hearts, Lord, thank you for your precious Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you that he comes to confirm the preached word about the Lord Jesus Christ. Your presence we could not live without, dear Holy Spirit. So do, Holy Spirit, please, what only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.